Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Good evening, everyone. You're in the right place at the right time. This is Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. You know, I knew when I saw the title that this was going to be good. The fact that someone called their comic series Estimate of the Situation told me the people behind it had done their homework and knew their stuff. And, of course, David Marlar is involved with it. David has a lifelong interest in UFOs, has actively investigated and researched the subject for 30 years. He joined MUFON back in 1990, was a trainee, then a field investigator, a state section director, uh, as an Illinois state director, and then he's become an internationally recognized UFO researcher and speaker, but he might be even more accomplished as an archivist. He's done so much to preserve and make available key classic records, files, and documents, and now is about to ready to do even more in a project we're going to talk about in a moment here. Um, Tom Orzachowski is an American comic book letterer, primarily known for his work on Uncanny X-Men for Marvel Comics. He came up through the fan community in Detroit in the late 60s. His first professional work in 1973 was on Marvel's British weekly titles. He got pulled over into the lettering department and in 1979 became the letterer for the Uncanny X-Men. You know those topics and those those titles. He's done something like 6,000 pages of X-Men script and has done many other projects well known in the uh, comics world. Tom and David, welcome to Coast to Coast. Thank you, George. Thanks, George. It's, uh, it's an honor to, uh, you know, be in the presence of two people who have contributed to something that's been uh, such a huge part of my life. Well, let me ask you, Tom, first to start, because this is the first your first time here on Coast. How did you get uh, uh, sucked into this subject? How long ago have you been digging into it? Well, my entire life, really. Uh, you know, on and off, you, uh, you kind of you talk about it with people, they, they tell you something, you listen to Coast to Coast, and you get more into it. Um, but you never really scratch the, you just scratch the surface of the topic. And one of my issues was when I was communicating with people, I was never able to articulate why I liked the topic um, or why I believed what I did. So I decided to go back into the archives and go back into the military correspondences and see what actually happened back in 1947, what started all of this. Um, you know, I come from very humble beginnings. Uh, I'm, I'm actually not the letterer. He has the same name as I do. We came up to the UFO Twitter community, and uh, this is our first graphic novel. So this has been, um, you know, like a really, really wild ride. But at the same time, the, uh, the, the best part of it is getting to the heart of the mystery, getting to the heart of like, why the people back then believed what they did and how they reacted to it. And I think that's really important because we're seeing history play out and repeat itself all over again. And I think that's why work that uh, David Marler is doing is, is just uh, incredibly important. Tom, I have to apologize. Have I been given the wrong information, the wrong bio for you? I think so. But it, he has the same exact name as uh, as I do. So I get that often, a lot. Oh, um, no. But, but, oh, but it's okay. I feel like an idiot. I'm so sorry. I apologize greatly for that. Can you Can you give us a little bit of your background then, if that was not the correct background? The projects you've yeah, worked on? Uh, I, uh, I'm a filmmaker in Brooklyn, New York, and, um, you know, I've been fascinated with this topic my entire life. And uh, honestly, I have um, I've just been dismayed by how it's been portrayed over the years. Uh, there's a certain level of uh, seriousness to it that I think people don't uh, they don't take into account just how serious our government took this topic. And it's become almost, uh, you know, stigmatized in a sense. So. You know, I, I just really decided to to get into the story, find out what was going on, and I found a narrative there. And uh, you know, the rest is history. So, are you the writer of the estimate of the situations? Then, yes, I am one okay. of the writers, okay. along with John Zoidis, who is the other writer, and then Ezekiel Anastasia is the artist. Well, I apologize again. We're going to fix that bio mistake on our website, and and uh, gosh, I'm I'm really sorry about it. But now we move on. 
Uh, David, I, before we jump into this project and the history of the subject, I'd like to get your take on what happened this week. Uh, I don't know what your expectation expectations were going into the hearing, uh, whether you felt it was worthwhile or not, but uh, give me your take on it. Well, George, I would just uh, echo everything that you said in the lead in to the show. Uh, you know, for those of us that have been involved in the subject for literally decades, uh, we have learned, I think, to temper our expectations accordingly. And if you were severely disappointed, you had your expectations set too high. <laughs> um, I, I have to, you know, comment on, on a personal note. Uh, when I was watching uh, Sean Kirkpatrick during that briefing, uh, he looked very uncomfortable. I don't know if that was your take on the situation, but he did not look like he really wanted to be there. Was kind of my assessment of, of his uh, his position. Uh, but despite that, I think he walked a, a fairly decent tightrope. Uh, admittedly. We can talk within UFO circles, but he's talking to the American public and really uh, to an international audience, and he's having to protect his integrity as a scientist, but also trying to present information. But uh, again, I was, uh, much like yourself, very underwhelmed by the substance of what was presented. Uh, I have to say on a personal note, I was, I was disappointed that only uh, 2% of the reports that they uh, broke down in the pie chart were triangles, uh, g given the fact <laughs> I wrote a book on the history of that subject. I, I really expected to see that percentage somewhat higher. But uh, despite that, I, I think one of the uh, interesting things to note, which obviously will be uh, kind of a cornerstone of our discussion this evening, uh, was the fact that the uh, statistics that they looked at, the cases that they provided in the, the few slides that they did present, if you noticed, it was only from the time frame 1996 to 2023. And uh, my question is, what about the 50 years uh, of information, cases, data, military encounters with UFOs that preceded that time period? And really, that's kind of the impetus for the, the project that we're working on, is really trying to focus on the history of this subject, which I think you would agree in the media coverage over the last few years, in the documentaries, et cetera, everyone is focusing on this 2004 USS Nimitz incident moving forward. And we all know your, your audience uh, being very knowledgeable on the subject, uh, as well as yourself with the, the vast amount of research you've done, there is a rich history and there are case files, literally thousands of case files that the American public has never seen. Uh, many of those we're currently digitizing uh, here in Albuquerque, uh, part of the NICAP, historic NICAP CUFOS case file collection. And we hope to get those digitized and eventually made uh, available to the general public. I know that it's the paper trail that got me hooked on the subject, because when I would read these reports, you know, there's one thing that the government has told the public, nothing to see here, move along, folks. Don't worry about it. Uh, not a threat to national security over and over and over again, decade after decade. And yet, if you once FOIA became the law of the land and these documents start appearing, we know that they have a different opinion behind the scenes, that they've studied this and, and have come to some alarming conclusions, some of which we're going to get into tonight. Tom, did you get a chance to watch that hearing? Did you have an, uh, a reaction as well? Oh, of course. Yeah, I, I saw the hearing. And uh, it looks like um, it's a continuation of a pattern where, uh, you know, we have these underfunded programs uh, whether it's Arrow, Blue Book, you know, Grudge, and it seems to be that they're not taking it as seriously as they should. Um, Kirkpatrick didn't necessarily look like he wanted to be there, which was a little disheartening, and I almost got, you know, Heineck vibes uh, from him. I'm not sure if anybody else felt the same way, but uh, he was definitely giving off that aura. And it's it's disheartening because, you know, like David said, there's a rich history to this topic, and there's thousands and thousands of case files that have real legitimacy but people, people think the genesis point is the Nimitz encounter. And, right. uh, you know, if you don't know the history, it's going to be bound to repeat itself. And I think, unfortunately, that's what we're seeing with this almost apathy, this underfunded program, as well as the fact that now we're placing it on a foreign adversary that, oh, no, this might be Chinese balloons or, or Russian satellites or whatever, which is the same trick that they've been pulling for the last 75 years. So for me, it was nothing new. It was very underwhelming, but, you know, par for the course. Kirkpatrick has been on the job, what, nine months now? And, boy, the public, at least, has not seen uh, much to show for what Arrow has been doing. And, you know, I, I sure hope they can pick up the pace and get the resources that the Congress has authorized for them. You know, 
I, I get the vibe, same as you, David. He, he didn't seem to be enjoying himself. I'm going to make a prediction that he's not going to be there in that job a, a, a year from now. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, by the end of the year, he's moved on. This, I'm sure he has realized this is not nearly as much fun as it sounds like. Um, I, and I'm, I'm really bothered, too, by we know for sure that he's been meeting with and hearing from some really well-placed whistleblowers, some insiders who have information about these legacy programs, about hardware, very definitive evidence. And, and he says he's seen no evidence. He's seen no, um, he's, he's obviously not, either he doesn't consider their testimony to be credible or he doesn't consider it to be evidence or what, what's your feeling on that? Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting, some of the statements, uh, they, they were somewhat contradictory in nature uh, because they did allude to the fact that they did have some individuals coming forward providing testimony. But at the same time, uh, one of the things that they, they love to continue to echo is the emphasis, and I appreciate this from a scientific standpoint, the emphasis for peer-reviewed scientific journals. Well, for decades, as you know, George, peer-reviewed scientific journals wouldn't even touch the UFO subject. Uh, but obviously now we're in a new era where there is an, an aura of credibility, uh, despite uh, the lack of substance in the most recent hearings and in some of the recent papers. What I find interesting, though, uh, George, is the fact that the videos and the examples that they continually share or cite with us that do have details are IFOs. It would be interesting if they could share a genuine UFO without divulging sensitive sources and methods of data collection. I certainly can you know respect the uh, uh, emphasis and importance of classification, but why can't we get some type of substantive description or report of one of the genuine UFOs? It almost seems like this is just filler that they're providing us when they give us these IFOs. Yeah, you know, and the you know claiming that the the orb that they show that the only data they have is the video itself that that's really kind of hard to believe since it was captured on a, a U.S. spy platform, a, a drone of some sort, and you have to believe they at least knew what size it was, how fast it was traveling, what the direction it was traveling, and none of that information was shared with the public. You, and you know, it um, you have to believe that they've got more information, and at least is a is a question mark. We're talking with David Marler, UFO researcher, writer, uh, archivist, and filmmaker Tom Orzachowski about their new project, something called Estimate of the Situation. It's terrific work. David, can you fill us in sort of on the historical background of those early studies and, and why this, this title uh, came into being? Absolutely, George. Uh, you know, we have to go back to 1947 and the famous sighting that really kind of launched the, the wave in 1947 of UFO sightings, that of Kenneth Arnold up near Mount Rainier, uh, private pilot flying, saw, you know, nine mysterious objects uh, while he was flying in, in a broad daylight, not, not little um, amorphous points of light in the sky, but structured vehicles of some type. And uh, he felt duty-bound to report those to military authorities, and, uh, you know, as I think Tom alluded to uh, it, earlier in the show, uh, the military authorities weren't immediately jumping to an extraterrestrial explanation. Uh, you know, we have to think back to 47, two years after the conclusion of World War II, uh, up near the Bering Strait, up around Washington. Uh, it, it was quite possible, could this be some type of advanced Soviet long-range bombers or aircraft? And uh, certainly... When you look back to the descriptions that Kenneth Arnold described, uh, it was very similar to some of the Nazi advanced aircraft designs of the time uh, towards the conclusion of World War II. So uh, much uh, like we're dealing with today, uh, based on national security interest, they thought that they needed to look at some of these reports, uh, starting with Kenneth Arnold. But again, that was just the beginning of an avalanche of reports in '47. And uh, what's interesting is the fact that the flying saucer uh, subject was born out of 47, as was the Air Force. Uh, you know, later, just literally a few months later, uh, in September, we had the formation of the Army Air Forces to the United States Air Force, and also a major restructuring of our national se security state. CIA. Uh, so, so, yes, absolutely, CIA, and uh, it was a very interesting year uh, beyond just UFOs. But it was during this transition of the Army Air Forces to the Air Force that they began looking at these reports, and again, through the lens of national security, which, as Tom alluded to, it's, it's kind of history repeating itself is what we're seeing today with these UAPs, what we now call UAPs. 
And so uh, what's interesting, though, is in those early years, and I'll let Tom speak to this as well, um, you had, as was referenced by Captain Edward J. Ruppelt in his famous book, Report on Unidentified Flying Objects, you had the pro-saucer enthusiasts within military echelon, and you had the anti-saucer uh, officers within the military echelon. Based on your, their own personal biases and beliefs or non-belief, uh, you had this bifurcation, essentially, within military ranks. And some people felt like they should be investigating this more, and other people were just trying to basically distance themselves from the UFO subject, thinking that they had more important things to focus on. And, you know, Tom and, and his group uh, have seized upon this early period in UFO history and have, you know, created this story where they've taken uh, fictional elements, but they've woven in so much of the real history, including original documentation from Project Sign, which really, when, when I first was made aware of his work, I was really impressed with it. Uh, so, Tom, walk us through some of those early days. It's such a great story. It's got a creepy X-Files feel to it, uh, but it's real. This stuff really did happen. And it, as I mentioned, there was something called Project Saucer, and then there was Project Sign, and those of us who've studied this stuff for a long time have read about this legendary document. It's sort of like looking for the lost ark or something, but this legendary document, an estimate of the situation in which the investigators put the report together, supposedly concluded, we think these things are ET. Is that your understanding? Yeah. And the, the, you know, the cool thing about Project Sign is, to my understanding, it is the only uh, it's, it's the only project that we know of where the government actually took this very seriously and it's been declassified, whereas Blue Book and Grudge are more PR campaigns trying to sweep this under the rug. Project Sign was formed out of the uh, response to these avalanche of sightings in 47. And it, what's really interesting, too, is uh, even though you had a schism in the Pentagon where some people thought saucers were real and some people didn't think they were real, um, all the way up until the, es the quote-unquote estimate of the situation, both parties agreed that something was flying around in the air. They just couldn't figure out what it was. They couldn't agree on what and what its source was. And, uh, you know, we had our best engineers on it. We had our best uh, aeronautical engineers, intelligence officers, scientists, mathematicians, really take a look at this and find out what this was because we wanted to know what was flying around in our sky. You know, first civilians started seeing things, and, no one really took that too seriously, like with Kenneth Arnold and such. But then when they start showing up around our military bases is really when the Pentagon started to take notice and put together this team. Uh, so this team didn't go in with any sort of expectation that this was an extraterrestrial source or a craft from a, another planet or anything like that. I mean, we were in the backdrop of uh, the beginnings of the Cold War, so there's a lot of Soviet paranoia going around. And what's really interesting is that this team of investigators, uh, which were, again, like the, the best we had in the country, they went from, is this a domestic project? No. They went through the proper channels. This is not a domestic project. Then they went through the, uh, the idea, oh, is this Soviet? Is this foreign? And slowly they came to the conclusion that there was no possible way that this could be Soviet and instead our interplanetary craft. Now, when they did draft the estimate of the situation, they did send it up the channels. Many people signed off on it. Many people from many different branches signed off on it all the way up until getting to Vandenberg, who was the chief of the Air Force at the time. He shot it down and said, no, give me another answer. And that's when the whole project got disbanded and you get grudge and blue book and so forth. But the idea that, you know, we had our best engineers, our best intelligence officers taking this seriously and coming to this conclusion it, nobody talks about this. I was I was stunned when I read about this when I went back into the archives. And even the language that these people were using with each other, there, there was no illusion as to whether something was flying around or not. Something was clearly in the skies, and they were just trying to figure out what and if it was a threat to national security. David, how solid is the evidence that Hoyt Vandenberg put the kibosh on this, that the report really did go to him, that it really did say, we think it might be E.T., and then he said, I'm not, I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to sign it. Kill it. And then the result was the Air Force got, a, got the, the message loud and clear, and from then on, they just they kind of muddied the waters. Absolutely. Uh, two of the best sources we have regarding the estimate of the situation in general, as well as 
Hoyt Vandenberg essentially rejecting the report come from, as I mentioned earlier, Captain Edward J. Ruppelt, who was head of Project Blue Book later, uh, but also uh, an individual that uh, the general public may not be as familiar with, with the name uh, Dewey Fournay. And Dewey Fournay uh, was the Pentagon liaison officer for, for Project Blue Book. Uh, in fact, uh, Captain Edward J. Ruppelt, when he came in, actually reported directly to Major Dewey Fournay. And uh, both of these gentlemen, uh, in written as well as audio testimony, refer to the estimate of the situation. They saw a copy of it. They read it. They acknowledged the size, the description of the report, and acknowledged that it went up the chain and then ultimately was shot down by Vandenberg. Uh, ironically enough, George, uh, you know, as we talk about this history going back, you know, to 47, uh, it, it, years later, uh, approximately 20 years ago, I was able to uh, receive personal effects of Dewey Fournays. And in fact, uh, Dewey attended the uh, famous 1953 CIA-sponsored Robertson panel. And uh, I have letters from Dewey uh, to another UFO researcher uh, whose collection I acquired, and they became good friends. And um, this individual acquired uh, Dewey Fournay's military attache case that actually has his name embossed in gold uh, on the outside. <laughs> and I have correspondence from Dewey stating that that was the military attache case that he personally took to the Robertson panel in 1953. And I have some of his index cards from some of the material that he was planning to present at that at that panel. So it, it's ironic as we talk about this, it seems abstract, but in our archives here in Albuquerque, uh, we do have some of the personal effects of Dewey Fournay. That's awesome. you got to you got to promise me you will never allow me to go through your archive because I'd be really tempted to pilfer some of that stuff. Open invitation, uh, George. Um, it, there's some. There's another name we need to mention, and that is Nathan Twining. So this is a document that, unlike the estimate of the situation, this one survived. It was something that he wrote. Uh, I think you know what I'm talking about, David, and maybe, Tom, you want to weigh Absolutely. on it as well. But that's, that's a gigantically important uh, historical document on this topic, right? It is. It's one of the uh, official documents, like you said, George, that, that we know of that actually survived any type of censorship. And uh, where basically uh, Nathan Twining states that, you know, the phenomenon is real, not visionary or fictitious, and even goes into descriptions. Uh, that, that's the famous quote that we often hear uh, from the memo. But the, the memo or the, the, the memorandum itself is uh, chock full of details talking about that these objects uh, 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 are uh, being observed by military observers that approximate the shape of a disk, uh, disc describes the extreme maneuverability and acceleration of these objects, and it's a very telling document. Uh, I would argue it's probably one of the most telling documents from that time period. Uh, Tom, tell us about the start of this project, uh, what the inspiration was, how big it's going to be, how many, volume, how many issues or volumes you might, you might envision. Well, yeah, I mean, the start of the project, basically, I, I wanted to find out what was going on because, again, I was trying to communicate to people about the topic, and I wasn't able to, and I, I just really wanted to find out for myself whether there was something to all this or not. So for me, it was going back to the documents, and not only going back to the documents, it was going back to all these researchers that have really put their careers on the line for the last 20, 30 years who are not in the limelight, you know, people like Jan Aldrich. Uh, Barry Greenwood, uh, Wendy Connors, you know, these people have archived uh, it, their own investigations. They're, they've written books about the topic, and I really wanted to find out whether there was something to it. So uh, I put together a board, and I ended up going through it piece by piece. I ended up co cold calling some uh, researchers to figure out, you know, if they would talk to me, and thankfully some of them did. And what happened was I just pieced together Project Sign from beginning to end, and I just, you know, I, I was amazed that no one really talked about this. No one really um, informed me about, you know, who the people involved were. And it was really, really hard to, to figure out who was doing what uh, and who was corresponding with who and so forth. So the idea became, like, how do I simplify this and make it into something more digestible for people, but still uh, maintain the historical accuracy? Because for me, that's really important. I think, again, if we don't know our history, it's, we're doomed to repeat it. So... Uh, you know, we put together a small team, me, myself, I mean, me, uh, another writer and, uh, and an artist, and we just got to work. And before we knew it, the, uh, the first issue came out, and we got a an overwhelming response. We spent a lot of time on it. 
And our, our motto really is to stick to documentation, stick to the historical record, because, again, we, we want this to be digestible and we want people to walk away with uh, an understanding of what happened during this time period, like this really hidden, cha hidden chapter of uh, American history. So um, right now we're looking at eight issues. We're, we're done with the first issue. Um, that's available for pre-order, and we, uh, we are blessed to, to basically partner up with the National Ufo Historical Records Center, David Marler, where half of uh, each purchase goes straight to their organization. And what they're doing are digitizing these documents and making them available for everybody, which is, comes full circle because a lot of researchers that, you know, I, I had to hit up to, to get information, I had to look into their archives, they work with David Marler. So it, it just was a natural symbiosis. And, and I can't, I, I mean, I can't say enough. Like, it's the best thing is to be able to give back to this community in a way that's helped me for the last few years. Um, so we're just going to go through the entirety of Project Sign and hopefully continue the series after that. But we want to focus on this particular moment in time so people can walk away with a really clear understanding. You know, the comics world, the graphic novel world, is so different from when I was a kid and collected these things. It's so big, such a powerful platform and a way to reach an audience. I was kind of curious whether or not the comics world, graphic novel world, really follows UFOs, if it was something that they that they were interested in, in, in a historical context. Can you speak to that? Yeah, you know, I, I ended up looking into other comic books that dealt with the topic, and again, the way this topic is portrayed is often very bombastic, very loud. Um, it doesn't give you a clear understanding of what actually happened or the players that were involved, like Nathan Twining that you guys mentioned earlier. Um, so the, yes and no, the, 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 there is an audience there, but at the same time, I wanted to provide something a little bit more grounded, rooted in historical accuracy. And frankly, you know, it's a passion project. I didn't really care if people were interested in it or not. It's something that I wanted to do and to be able to walk away from where if someone else picked up that book, it would lead them down their own rabbit hole and they'd be very well informed and armed with the right tools and the right information for them to make their own decisions. Well, I can tell you that I read it today. It's just terrific. It's very, it's dark. It's kind of creepy and and uh, furtive. And that really, uh, that comes across uh, as an effective storytelling uh, method. And the fact that you have the recreations of some of these early documents included in there makes them so powerful. I, I just love it. Thank you. Yeah. It, I mean, it's it's been a labor of love. It's And the reason why it's so dark is, again, because there was an overcast of a Cold War with Russia while this was going on. So, I mean, if you talk about Project Sign, you know, the people they were reporting to, the Atomic Energy Commission, the Joint R&D Board, uh, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which later became NASA, it, like this was a very, very serious project reported to top level uh, people, the highest classification. And the reason for this was because they were scared. And you can see it in the language of the documentation when they corresponded with each other. Like what David Marler was uh, talking about earlier, they were they were basically describing the characteristics of this craft, uh, what to look out for. Uh, this was not a fun time, I, I have to say. I don't think it'd be a fun time to be at Wright-Patterson, 1947, 1948. David, as you and I have talked about before, you know, what they wrote to each other, memos and reports and things of that sort, in the years before FOIA was the law of the land, uh, is so illuminating for me. It really is what, what captured my interest in the topic because of, uh, it becomes pretty clear from those kinds of documents, that they were telling one thing to the American public and something else to each other, right? Absolutely, George. I completely agree. And in fact, you know, one of the uh, collections that we have here at the National UFO Historic Record Center are the uh, case files from the Center for UFO Studies, Dr. G. Allen Hynek's organization. And Dr. Mark Rodiger is one of our board members for our, our organization. Uh, I became curator for those files back in uh, November of 2020, and uh, to echo what you just mentioned, uh, I have to tell you, it's extremely illuminating to go through the original documents that were owned by Dr. Hynek during his tenure as scientific advisor during Blue Book. Quite often, you read and you hear about in documentaries that Hynek's perspective on the UFO subject changed in later years. Uh, George, I'm here to tell you, uh, if you or if your audience were here looking at some of these documents, as early as the early to mid-1950s, you see, and I, in fact, I've got some right here in front of me, uh, where Dr. Hynek 
has the original government documents, and he's writing marginalia on the side where he has uh, direct uh, conflict with Air Force explanations. He would always abbreviate Air Force as AF, and he would often write, why didn't AF investigators obtain radar in this case? Why didn't hmm. AF investigators interview the other pilots? And quite often, uh, you'll see where they, he crosses out three or four times, and he would always usually write with red felt pen. He, he would cross out the official explanation that might say ball lightning, and underneath he would write in uppercase letters, unidentified. So you see that there was this consternation, this issue that he was having with the Air Force explanations, even as early as the early to mid-50s. We're talking with David Marler and writer, filmmaker Tom Orzechowski about Estimate of the Situation, this new graphic novel comic series uh, that has just started and is going to benefit a, a massively important project. We're going to get into some of the, more of the details on that in a moment. So, Tom, you indicated that the initial response to Estimate of the Situation has been pretty positive. If, if, it, if it continues to be that, then this could go on. Yeah, no, we were actually overwhelmed with the uh, the response, you know, because you think UFOs are a niche topic, but uh, it turns out a lot more people are into it than you think, and a lot more people have, might have seen it than you think. And, um, yeah, so the, we are continuing the series up to uh, eight issues. We're going to be telling the entirety of Project Sign from beginning to end. Uh, that is the goal. And uh, with each issue, we get closer to not only the mystery, but understanding why certain people in these positions thought what they did. Um, you're a filmmaker, though. I saw a uh, a clip, a promo clip uh, that had been put on the on the website. Uh, it, I mean, this could be a film as well, couldn't it? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's that, that is the goal. Um, like I said, I've been really dismayed with how this topic has been portrayed in media uh, for the most part. We we've had some really good stuff come out. Um, you know, I have to uh, shout out James Fox's phenomenon, which really was an inspiration for this. But uh, a, a movie is. Um, is in in talks for sure but the the problem is you want to make sure it's done justice because i feel like as a community um we've just gotten the short end of the stick for too long with this topic so i want to make sure it's done right and the first way to do that is to deliver a graphic novel where people can walk away with a very clear and compelling understanding of what went on during that first explosion in 1947. Cool. uh david you know, every time I've seen interviews with you that we've done on Zoom or, or interviews about you, there's video shot of, of your facility there, your archives. It makes me it makes me sick, really, because uh, you're so organized and meticulous. And then I look around my office here and uh, the piles of papers and boxes and stuff. And really, you really tick me off. But uh, <laughs> so could you describe I mean, I, I can't imagine how much space you have. And then how much space you will need, assuming everything goes well, what will this project lead to? What the benefit from estimate of the situation, if, the, if it produces enough profit, you build something really cool, right? Absolutely, George. And something for the future, not just for, for the current generation that's now looking at the subject, but for future generations. I mean, it, it truly is something I think that's going to be monumental. And, you know, to take a step back for a moment in, in answer to your question, uh, when I first got involved, I, I thought I could naively go to my local library and find books on the subject. And I very quickly realized that uh, libraries had little or no books on the subject. And if I was going to have a library, I'd have to build my own. Well, I envisioned a bookcase in my living room back in 1990. I didn't envision having to add on a new addition to my home. And, yes, I'm blessed with a, a very uh, generous wife and patient wife that deals with this. Uh, but we added a new addition in 2017. And, in fact, um, you know, uh, uh, Tom mentioned James Fox. James Fox was one of the first people here. And James admitted that the first hour of his documentary he couldn't have done without the archives. Uh, I basically opened the doors and let him go through the archives and, and all of the visual and, and audio elements, virtually all of them, in the first hour of his documentary were derived from my archive. And, and James was very appreciative of that. And that's one of the reasons we want to create this archive is for filmmakers, but also for scientists and educators as well. And, um, you know, the problem that I'm facing is that I have a home-based archive, despite adding a new addition onto the home. And, you know, Tom alluded to some of my team members, Mr. Barry Greenwood, uh, Jan Aldridge, Rob Swiatek, Rod Dyke, uh, who has one of the largest collections in the country, uh, as well as Dr. Mark Rodiger with the Center for UFO Studies. And I'm here to tell you, George, we also, in the last year, acquired the Antonio Huneus Collection, 
which is vast and diverse, uh, material from all different countries, uh, a number of South American and European countries. Uh, we also just in the last month uh, received a pallet from the UK from Philip Mantle. And so we have approximately 12 additional collections heading our way. I did a lecture series last year, and in meeting with other individuals and telling them about what we're doing, we've already had commitments from approximately 12 other researchers uh, averaging between the age of 65 to 85 who are wrestling with the problem, what am I gonna, what's going to happen to my collection when I die, or what, what's going to happen when I retire from the subject? And so we have the largest collection of historical materials ever assembled that will be centralized here in the Albuquerque area with the express purpose of making it available to the general public, but also, as Tom alluded to, digitizing it so we can make it also widely available on, on the, the Internet for the worldwide UFO community. And so it's an idea that was born out of necessity. And really, the way I like to kind of uh, describe it is the National Archives of Ufology. We have the National Archives, and that's wonderful. Good luck trying to find UFO information. It's like a needle in a haystack. But people like Jan Aldridge and Barry Greenwood, who filed FOIA requests, who went to the National Archives, went to many of these different archives across the country, like Maxwell Air Force Base, where I've done research as well, uh, they've already done the lion's share of work in, in culling all of these documents and materials together. Well, we're at a point in time in history, which I think is unique, where they're all wanting to find a future home for these collections. And by virtue of just my affiliation, my working relationship, and mutual respect with these individuals, they've all agreed to centralize that material here. And I can't house that in my home. And so we've now had to take it beyond the concept of a home-based historical archive, and we're looking to have a freestanding building that will be a true historical archive for UFO research. And... Uh, you know, New Mexico, obviously, George, is very unique, not only because of Roswell, but many other UFO historical cases that have occurred here, the Farmington Flying Saucer Armada that you and I talked about the last time when we spoke, and uh, the Socorro, New Mexico incident. Many, many UFO reports uh, by civilians and military uh, over the decades here in New Mexico. But as a result of that, the New Mexico culture is very open to the subject. I'm very happy to share with you that after we announced this new organization in November when we got our 501c3 status, uh, I presented to Senator Martin Heinrich's office and Senator Ben Ray Luan's office, and they were very intrigued by what we were proposing to the point where we have put in a request for congressional funding. And I've been told by the offices that we have the support of the senator in one particular case, who is going to support our request for congressional funding. And we're talking some, something in the neighborhood of six figures. But in addition to that, I have the local mayor here of Rio Rancho, the town, the suburb of Albuquerque that I live in, who is wanting to support us. I have the county commissioner uh, who was here just two weeks ago, who I'll be presenting to the county commission in another two weeks. They want to provide funding to help us with this. And in addition to that, this week, literally in the next few days, I'll be meeting with State Senator Mo Maestas. And Mo Maestas has stated that he would like to also assist with providing some state funding for this. So every individual within local, county, state, and federal government has expressed interest in financially helping us. But we also need the support of the UFO community in that respect. And so as a result, that's where Tom and I kind of came together through a mutual friend and colleague, and we decided that uh, their respect for the UFO subject really mirrors our respect for preserving the history. And so uh, as a result of the estimate of the situation, we hope that that will also help garner some money to help us secure a freestanding building. And we already have one identified that we're looking at. Uh, we're just waiting for the government funding to come in, but also any, any independent donations we can uh, solicit from the UFO community. And in having that freestanding building, we can now bring in and centralize all these collections from the, the individuals who I mentioned and truly have this organized in an academic fashion. And, George, since I moved here to Albuquerque about 11 years ago, I've given local lectures. Almost every UFO lecture I've given over the last 11 years here in the Albuquerque area, I've had an individual come up or two individuals come up who stated, I'm a research scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratories, or I'm a research scientist at Sandia National Laboratories. The scientific community here in New Mexico is extremely interested. So 
to create an institution where we centralize the government documents and news clippings and audio recordings, all of this information under one roof, not only will it be available to the general public, but it will be a, a credible institution whereby serious scientists from Los Alamos and Sandia can come in and access that material. And it won't have the trappings of uh, any type of other UFO attraction. We're not going to have little gray aliens waving. We're going to have a true, serious academic institution that will appeal to the general public, but one that won't dissuade serious academics and scientists from com coming through and gracing our doors. That's awesome. I mean, there should be something like this already. There should it's be amazing. something within the halls of government, right? It's amazing we don't have this. And in fact, that's what I presented to the senator, uh, Senator Heinrich's office, because obviously Senator Heinrich's on the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee looking at this, along with Marco Rubio and others, and it resonated with the office. They were very intrigued by what we were proposing. And I brought in some of the original government documents to show, you know, here's my bona fides. Here, here are some of the original blue book documents that even the National Archives doesn't have, that we have here. And so, uh, the, you know, when they saw that, when they saw, heard the audio recordings that we have, when, when they really conceptualized what we had to offer, it was a unique point. It's in a unique place at a unique time, and especially with this new credibility that's being afforded to the subject. And in fact, George, uh, I'm, I'm still amazed, uh, but in the next three weeks, I will actually be presenting a UFO lecture at Kirtland Air Force Base, talking oh, wow. about the history and talking about this, this project. I was contacted by a group called Coronado Thunderbirds, which is a retired group of FAA Air Force personnel Sandia National Laboratory and Los Alamos National Laboratory scientists, and they contacted our organization and said, would you like to come in and talk more about the history and talk about this organization, this archive you're creating? So on May 9th, I will be at Kirtland Air Force Base presenting on UFOs, believe it or not. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, I mean, when you see people like uh, Sean Kirkpatrick or the, the folks, Tom, you I don't know if you saw the first public hearing. Um, wherein a couple of congressmen asked some fairly pointed questions of the Pentagon guys who were like deer in a head, you know, deer in Bull the headlights kind of a look. They didn't know the answers. They had seemingly no knowledge of the history of the subject. <laughs> yeah, and that, that, that infuriated me. I, I'm deeply embedded in the in the subject, and when I saw that, it was uh, it was hard to watch. And, you know, I, there's, a, there's a coffee shop near me, and I, I've given out some of these comic books to, uh, to a few people that I know in the neighborhood. And one of the comments I got from a relatively young person was um, after he's read it and I come in and get my coffee, and he's like, hey, man, did all that really happen? You know, <laughs> and, and the answer is yes, <laughs> emphatically yes. You know, and nobody really knows about this. So there, there's a, you know, a group of older people who have lived through this who would want to see in historical uh, archives. And there's also a younger generation who hasn't been exposed to this, uh, who I'm sure is, are interested. They just don't know that these things exist. They don't know that these records and these memos exist, and they're not able to, you know, they're not able to form their own conclusions from them. And, and one of the cool things about going through these documents is you find all sorts of things where, you know, th there's often uh, that um, that fallacy where people say, oh, well, Kenneth Arnold saw the, the he had his sighting and. They misquoted him saying it's saucers, so everyone thinks it's saucers. Well, that's actually not true. We have records of, of flying disc sighting through a theodolite, through an observed instrument in April 1947 before Kenneth had his sighting, before saucers were on anybody's mind. So it's little clues like this that give you a much better con uh, a better context of the story, a better context of what happened. And I, I think that's really for the, for the younger generation that's going to be really, really important moving forward. I love uh, I love uh, one of the documents you included in Estimate of the Situation. The first volume here is from uh, my backyard, Lake Mead. So right after right after the Kenneth Arnold sighting, there were sightings all over the place. A huge wave of cases from all over the U.S. that were being reported. And one of the first ones after Arnold was uh, something flying pretty close over Lake Mead that I think some U.S. Navy pilots encountered. That's a, that's a cool document to have in there. You know, David, yeah. as a student of the um, of this topic, you you know that the same kinds of excuses that are being given now to explain these things away were given back then. You know, we see now, oh yeah, the, this that orb that must be some Chinese drone or it's a balloon or something like that. Uh, that there have been attempts to dismiss this stuff long before the technology that we know exists now has have been around, right? 
Yeah, absolutely, yeah. George. And, and mm-hmm. as I alluded to earlier, you know, the, the focus of the dialogue should be on the smaller subset of unidentified objects. Uh, I, I will concede in going through the NICAP civilian UFO case files, and there's thousands of them spanning the decades, uh, the vast majority are probably Venus or a satellite or, you know, any type of atmospheric phenomenon uh, that could easily be discounted. But we don't care about those. You know, it, it's, it's the needle in the haystack again. Uh, we're trying to find those cases th- that is that small residing body of reports that defies explanation. And I don't go out and do lectures and talk about IFOs. That would bore an audience to tears, uh, much like what we had with the recent hearings, where they're just describing things that they're just explaining away. Well, tell me about the ones that defy explanation. That's what the focus of the dialogue, that's what the focus of the conversation should be. Yeah, Tom, you, you've seen the same kind of a thing, you know, in the more recent cases, uh, the warships on the West Coast. Well, there's got to be Chinese drones. The The idea of people using uh, foreign technology, Russians, now Chinese, the objects that do the same thing now were doing the same thing in the late 40s and 50s. Obviously, the Chinese drones weren't zipping around over the United States back in those days. Right. They're recycling the same excuses. And what I like about at least like 47 and going to the 50s is I find it very uncontaminated with uh, technology that we might have had we might have today where they can use it to explain away where you're right. We didn't have drones like that zipping away in the late forties and early fifties where you can just discount it. Um, especially when it's cited by multiple uh, military pilots, you know, corroborated by uh, many officials in the area, depending on the sighting. So it, it, again, it, it just goes back to like being educated in what happened and, and not falling to the same, uh, the same bag of tricks that the government's going to pull out and say, well, no, these, this is something else, or this is some sort of foreign technology. Well, you've used that excuse already. We've heard this before, except now it, it's not as believable as it was before. Uh, you mentioned a name, Barry Greenwood. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, David, Barry Greenwood had such a, I, I've had very little contact with him, just a little bit over the years, but he had such a big influence on me. That book that he wrote with uh, Fawcett, I, I, it's retitled something. It's the UFO cover-up. I'm trying to remember what the title was before, but Clear that was, intent. yeah, Clear Intent. Gosh, that was such a spectacular achievement. Uh, it really, if I had to point to one book in terms of the government document sort of a, a venue, uh, that would be it for me. That That's a terrific book. I can only imagine what treasures await you in his files. Oh, absolutely. And that book was very instrumental in shaping my mindset when I first got involved in the UFO subject as well, George. And it's ironic that years, decades later, now Barry and I have become best of friends. And, you know, we, we correspond almost on a daily basis. And it's it's somewhat surreal because I never thought I would get to know him as I do. And he's, as I mentioned, one of our board members for the National UFO Historical Records Center. And, you know, who better uh, to be a board member than Barry? Because he was the pioneer when it came to FOIAs. We, we hear about uh, John Greenwald and the great work that he's done with FOIAs. But, you know, Barry was doing this long before John was a twinkle in his parents' eye. <laughs> Yeah, those uh, I, I can't imagine uh, what kind of fancy talking you have to do to get some of these UFO researchers, the long time guys, to give up their files. Because, I mean, I, I know how I would feel about it. It's like pry it out of my cold, dead fingers kind of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it, 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 it's a form of relief because, again, you know, over time we'll be receiving these collections. But, uh, you know, again, with, with the advancing age and, and health uh, declining with certain researchers, it gives them peace of mind. Uh, in fact, uh, I mentioned about a dozen collections. There's a few where individuals are getting into a point where they're having health issues and they want to ensure that their legacy, and truly that's what it is, it's their legacy, is preserved for future generations. I can only imagine how much stuff has been tossed out by survivors of somebody who is at this for decades and then just... If you'd like more information about the National UFO Historical Records Center that David Marler is spearheading... We've got a link on our Coast to Coast AM website. And also, if you want to find out more about how to order a copy of Estimate of the Situation, this excellent uh, graphic novel comic uh, treatment of the historical story on UFO studies from the late 40s on, uh, we've got that link on our website as well. Um, What I find interesting, though, is, uh, you know, I was working on a presentation this afternoon, and quite often we hear about astronomers being called in as the experts regarding UFOs. And... Then I was looking at some interviews with Dr. James McDonald, an atmospheric physicist, you know, back in the 60s that was looking at the subject. 
And, you know, I'm not necessarily uh, sold on any particular hypothesis, whether it's the extraterrestrial hypothesis or what have you. I'm interested in things that are moving within our atmosphere, not necessarily uh, in orbit around the planet or in outer space. Uh, so, you know, are these things, you know, popping in and out within our atmosphere to the point where it's not going to be seen in space? Um, I just don't know. You know, again, we don't know what we're dealing with. But I would, I would say, though, that within the atmosphere, I think we have uh, hundreds of tracking of UFOs on ground-based as well as air-based radar, as well as ground-based and air-based visual sightings. So even though they may not be seen in space, I think we have ample uh, information and cases. In fact, I have one here from Vandenberg Air Force Base, October 6, 1967, uh, we just recently uh, stumbled across these logs from Vandenberg Air Force Base, and ironically enough, in another collection, we had audio recordings of the radar operators. So, um, yes, uh, as far as space-based uh, witnesses or tracking or visuals, uh, I, I, I haven't seen much credible information in that area. There's a lot of stories, but, you know, those stories need to be backed up. But uh, I think there's ample information within our atmosphere that have been tracked by not just the United States military, but other militaries across the, the globe. We often hear statements that astronomers don't see UFOs, which is not true. I mean, I, I'm not sure that a telescope looking out into deep space is the best instrument to use for seeing things that are flying around in our atmosphere. But astronomers do see them. Uh, J. Allen Hynek was an astronomer, if you'll recall. Uh, Clyde Tombaugh, I think, discoverer of Pluto uh, had his own UFO sighting. There are cases where astronomers see them. Uh, I don't think there's a, a lot of them, but there are some. Uh, George, it's, I, I, if I may interrupt, I'm actually sure. sitting here, and I've got Clyde Tombaugh's handwritten original UFO report as part of the uh, NICAP case I'll be darned. right here. Wow. <laughs> Quite often people take issue with the fact that the government is framing this discussion in the context of national security with these things being a threat. But I think the key word is potential threat. And if you're in a position within the military or intelligence community, uh, that's your job. You view everything as a potential threat, uh, or, and you do a threat assessment. Uh, but I, 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 like you, Norm, I, I don't necessarily fe fear these things. Uh, we haven't seen any major signs of overt hostility. But if you have objects that are moving within restricted airspace near military operations areas through controlled uh, commercial air corridors that are exhibiting flight characteristics that apparently are superior to your latest technologies, they have to view it as at least a potential threat until they better understand it. And I've always argued over the years that I I've always felt that the quote-unquote UFO cover-up has been based on ignorance, not knowledge, uh, that you know they don't want to admit they don't know what's going on, but I feel that they do know that there's something going on a as the estimate of the situation uh, that Tom was describing, alluded to, and, uh, you know, other statements by military officials and documents that we have that have uh, referenced the reality of the subject. But just because we know something is doesn't mean we know what it is. Uh, thanks for the call. Uh, to Tom, I did want to m uh, mention if people want to order estimate of the situation, they can do so now, right? Yeah, so we are doing pre-orders now, and we'll be shipping them out in two or three weeks. Uh, you can order them at blacktielabs.nyc. I would just like to add to, to that last caller. Uh, you know, the the act of indifference is an act in of itself, and that, that's something I, would, I think people should keep in mind, especially when these are cited around sensitive military installations more and more so in the last couple of years. You would think if this is an intelligence from somewhere else, maybe it's another planet or another reality or dimension or something like that, if it's here, uh, that it would make sense that it concentrates on military installations and nuclear sites because it wants to know what our capabilities are. Uh, that, that sort of makes sense to me. One of the phrases I hear repeated time and time again at UFO conferences, why doesn't the government just release this information? We can handle the truth. Well, what is the truth, uh, to your point? Um, you know, are, are there human mutilations like cattle mutilations that are being done? We don't know. But, you know, that's just one, you know, uh, dark example of possibilities that could exist out there. Um, and so I, I think we need to be very careful about uh, assuming what we can or can't handle, uh, given the fact that we don't know what really the parameters of this are. And beyond UFOs and quote unquote aliens, if I can use that term, um, I think that Part of the cover-up 
uh, and this is sheer speculation on my part, I need to preface this, uh, I think that some of it deals with not the idea of another intelligence interacting with us, but I think it, it deals with the fundamental nature of reality. George, as you alluded to, one of the working hypotheses is that th th this may be uh, entities or intelligences from another dimension. Well, it's one thing to say to people, you know, we're sending out probes to other planets and, and other star systems, and this is just basically the equivalent of someone else's technology doing the same thing. It's a whole other category of crazy to try to convey to people that, well, there are these entities, they're non-human, they come from an, uh, a parallel dimension, they can literally wink in and wink out anywhere at any time, and we have absolutely no control of it, and they may be taking people and taking them into this other dimension. This is now in a whole other category. And so when we say that we can handle the truth, uh, it, it, like you said, it depends on what that truth is. Yeah, be careful what you wish for. Uh, David Marler, Tom Orzachowski, thanks so much. Great conversation. Tom, this is a terrific uh, piece of work here, this first uh, issue, and I can't wait to see issue number two. Thank you so much, George. That, that means a lot, seriously. Uh, you guys are welcome here anytime. And uh, again, if you want to check out uh, uh, more information about the National UFO Historical Records Society or estimate of the situation, we got uh, links on our website. Thanks, gentlemen. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.